we are. Good evening, everyone. Good to have those of you visiting or checking in or listening online, either now or later. We're in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. And again, we're talking about the timing of the rapture in comparison to the tribulation. Uh, there are three views, pre-tribulation rapture, that Christians do not go through any part of Daniel's 70th week. We are raptured out uh, ahead of time. That's the view I unapologetically hold. Uh, there is a mid-tribulation where, again, just like the name, it happens at the three and a half year point of the seven years. And then there is the post-tribulation where uh, those that hold to this believe that Christians will go through all seven years of God's judgment on this earth and then be raptured out at the end. And I will tell you right out of the gate that the verses we are looking to, we looked at last week, um, kind of introduced them. We're going to look at them a little bit more in depth. Uh, they are actually verses that post-tribulation people like because it seems to teach that Christians go through the tribulation and Christ comes at the end. So we are going to uh, dissect, okay, so how do I as a pre-tribulationist um, handle those verses? And so that's part of what uh, we're going to get into. But again, just a, a couple more things in the way of review. Uh, two, uh, among several, there are, are two things that we need to keep in mind as we read First and Second Thessalonians. And as you, when, when you know the theme, of, when there's a concept that continues through both books, and when there's a theme that's in both books, uh, when you go to interpret things, those things should be in the back of your mind. They should sway to a certain degree. How They, they help you interpret certain scriptures. And uh, one thread that we talked about and uh, uh, we'll see that, you can see that in 2 Thessalonians 1, uh, verse 4. 2 Thessalonians 1, verse, uh, verse 4, so that we ourselves glory in you, in the churches of God. We brag about you, Paul says, to other churches for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endured. Verse 5, so it's, Persecution, tribulation, verse 5, manifest token of the righteous judgment of God that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you also suffer. Uh, end of verse 6 talks about them that trouble you. Uh, verse 7, and to you who are troubled. And again, that's the, the troubled there is the idea of, of tribulation. So they were, the, the one of the themes, one of the threads is that, you know what, the Christian life, is not about a bed of roses. It is not about a life of ease. There will be trials. There will be tribulations. There will be persecutions. And so that is something that he taught them as newborn Christians that, you know what, you're going to have trials and trouble. And I mentioned that last week. And then uh, another reason, uh, or another reminder, is to keep in mind why, uh, why Paul wrote uh, things chapter two, so second, third, probably the same page you're on. Chapter two. Uh, now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto Him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed. And so Paul was writing in part to clear up some confusion that they had about the day of the Lord and about the coming of Christ. I can't, I'm not going to take the time to find the verse, but they went so far as some of them were were literally quit their jobs and just sitting around waiting for the Lord to come. I mean, they weren't doing anything. And Paul's like, no, you, you need to do things. So he, they were confused about, you know, in their mind, it was like, wow, the rapture came and we missed it. Or 
the day of the Lord is at hand and he's going to come at any moment. And so we don't have to do anything. We're just going to be, you know, and, and he's like, no, these trials are not the tribulation. You're not in it. The rapture is still coming. And, you know, we're, uh, first Thessalonians 4, you don't need to turn there, but we don't want you to be ignorant about this. And then he explained the rapture, but you already know about the day of the Lord, that it comes as a thief in the night. And so they had tribulation. They were going to face tribulation, and I don't mean big T, seven years. I mean trials, I mean persecutions. Uh, and he wrote to help them understand some of the end time things. So as we interpret then verses that are like, oh, okay, uh, that should be in the back of our mind. Okay, uh, first of all, the righteous judgment of God. And again, some of this is review from last week, and, and I like to, you know, line upon line, precept upon precept. Uh, when you go back and review, it helps you build on, uh, kind of like math, right? You have to, you have to keep on remember, remembering uh, multiplication tables and addition and subtraction because uh, when you do the higher stuff, if you don't have that background, it, it doesn't work. So, okay, wife, it's not like math, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the, here's the, here's the, the, the building. So righteous judgment of God. We see in verse 6, seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense, pay back, tribulation to them that trouble you. Uh, God is righteous. God is just. God uh, doesn't forget things, you know, and you look at, at this life and, uh, you know, things that people get by with, it seems, you know, uh, unsolved murder mysteries of who did what, and, you know, I mean, just any kind. I was reading an article just the, uh, the, the other day, today, about, you know, this doctor and his son are out hiking, or they were out for, um, in their Jeep or something, and a guy shot the dad, and the kid ran off through the woods. It's kind of in a bunch of different People magazine is featuring it, and, you know. But there's some people that do stuff like that, and they never get caught. Yeah. They don't get caught. Well, guess what? They get caught. God knows, and so Paul is encouraging them. Listen, they seem to have the upper hand. You are suffering um, for no real reason other than you're doing right. Uh, you are suffering at their hands, but God is not going to forget that. God knows that they will be paid back, if not in this life, in the next. And that's what Paul is kind of uh, encouraging them. Uh, who is going to be paid back? Uh, those that trouble you, uh, verse 6. And then uh, verse 8, and, and again, I, I mentioned this last week, MacArthur calls these the, the most terrifying words outside of uh, Revelation. Uh, when, verse 7, I'll back up, to you are trouble, rest with us, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel. And again, some commentators uh, want to differentiate uh, those that know not God are the Gentiles and those that obey not the gospel are the Jews. And I tend to think it's talking about the same group of people. It's unsaved people in general uh, don't know God experientially. They know about him, but they don't know him because they have not obeyed the gospel. If you obey the gospel, you know God. If you disobey the gospel, you don't know God. You, you know about him, but you don't know him personally. And again, people know it's Jews, it's Gentiles. Doesn't probably matter all that much. Uh, the bottom line is, though, unsaved people, and that's, that's the most important takeaway, is that unsaved people, verse 9, will be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord. I, I was uh, in the car on the way to Madison uh, this morning and listened to Adrian Rogers and and uh, he said, he, he was talking about how there are some preachers that will not preach on hell. They, it's unpopular to talk about everlasting destruction. And he said, 
I don't care if the Supreme Court decided that there is no more hell and we're going to get hell out of the English language. It doesn't matter. It's God still says it, and it is everlasting destruction. That's not a contradiction in terms, okay? Well, if they're destroyed, then they're destroyed. And some people want to say, well, it's annihilated and they're, and they're, they're obliterated and there's nothing. No, there is an everlasting uh, Jesus himself. Uh, the suffering never ends. Worm dieth not. Fire is not quenched. We think weeping and gnashing of teeth. And, you know, I mentioned mercy. Uh, the rich man in hell considered mercy a drop of water on the tip of his tongue. That was, that was mercy. And so uh, hell is a real place and a real fate for those that reject Christ. And Paul is telling them that even if it seems like this whole life, they get by with unmercilessly persecuting you, there will be a recompense. There will be a, a day. And uh, it's not just everlasting destruction, but it's also uh, from the presence of the Lord. And uh, again, I, I think it's always good to be reminded of this. Uh, people will... You know, hell won't be so, so bad. My friends will be there. We'll party. No, you won't even have friends in hell. You will, you, there is nothing good. Any kind of, of feelings that you have towards people that are good, you won't have. There is nothing good. The absence of God means the absence of good. And, and there's a lot of things that unsaved people, you know, unsaved people really uh, like some of the benefits of Christianity. They like neighbors that are nice to them. They like neighbors that are not, um, you know, cutting their trees down and, you know, um, <laughs> using their driveway and throwing sticks. Okay, you know, time to mow the lawn. Okay, oh, these sticks, I'm just going to throw these sticks in there. You know, I mean, they like neighbors that are good Christian people. They like the fact that God is good to them and lets their garden grow just like lets their neighbor grow their neighbors grow but uh you know there's there's people that they don't understand the general goodness of god that they enjoy every single day uh and that is missing that will be missing uh in hell and then uh we, we need to remember that and then it's not just uh retribution and recompense uh, but there would be uh, relief there would be rest for them and uh, verse 7 is kind of interesting. And, and I, I say it's interesting because uh, I dare say I have been reading it wrong till yesterday. I just like, wow, how did I not see that before? And I'm, hopefully I can explain this to you. So the big, the, keep this in mind. Paul is saying uh, it's a righteous thing, verse 6, with God to do two things. Recompense tribulation to them that trouble you and to you who are troubled, you get rest. You know, you, 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 I've read it, it's like, okay, and to you who are troubled, rest. You know, you need to relax. You guys need to relax. To do you her, so rest is looked at as a action word, a verb. You, those of you that are troubled, you need to rest. Stop stressing out, stop panicking, relax, okay? But that's not what the verse is saying. Rest is a noun in the Greek. So when, when if I slow it down and put commas in there, okay, to those that trouble you, they're going to get tribulation. But to you who are troubled, you're going to get rest. You're going to get relief. And so I, I literally have been like reading it wrong. And it's like, no, don't, don't you take it upon yourself to rest. Don't you relax, you rest. No, your relief and rest is what God is giving you. Here's the two groups. Those that trouble you are getting trouble. 
You who are getting troubled are getting relief. You're getting rest. Uh, hope you follow that. Hopefully that uh, I was able to convey that. Um, so Very next well. is, did you say something? Very well. Oh, okay. Um, so we are given as a gift. They were going to be given and notice with us. So Paul, uh, if you jump up to verse one, the writers was Paul, Timothy, uh, Sylvanus is actually Silas. Uh, so the, those three men were going to get relief and rest along with them. So now the question is, and that's what we're, I, I want us to consider now, is the timing of this. And I, I already mentioned earlier that verses 6 through 8 are something that post-tribulationists use as, here is what we hang our hat on, here is proof from God's word that Christians will go through the tribulation and that the rapture will not occur until the end. And these are the verses that they use. Where are you? Six is verses 6 through 8. Because here's what they're saying to you. Uh, uh, Second chapter Thessalonians, one. chapter 1, yep. Verses 6 through 8. Because uh, verse 7, you will get rest when the Lord Jesus comes from heaven with his angels and then punishes everybody. So that they will say, all right, when God comes to recompense is the same time that you're going to be free from this tribulation. Um, and so how do I, as a pre-tribulationist, uh, answer this? So here's uh, three thoughts. Uh, number one, some... And, and again, hopefully I can explain this. Some scholars suggest that the phrase, and to you who are troubled, rest will come to you, uh, they will consider that parenthetical. Okay, and here's what I mean that, by that. You, you put that, you know, sometimes you'll be uh, saying, you'll say something and, or you'll read something and it'll be in parenthesis. It's, it's kind of helpful, but it's not the main point of what's being discussed. So the main point Paul is discussing, verse 6, is here's what's going to happen to those that trouble you. They are going to get tribulation. Uh, verse 8, God is going to bring vengeance on them. Verse 9, they are going to be punished with everlasting destruction. So the verses are about here's what's going to happen to them. That's the focal point. Here's what's happened to them. Oh, but by the way, you're going to get rest. So it's a parenthesis, okay? I will admit to you and to you on camera, that there are going to be those that are going to say, you're stretching that, okay? Uh, they have to stretch other verses that are more obvious to point to, I believe, we're out of here. They have to stretch it more. Uh, so I, I am not denying the fact that, okay, you know, it's, but I have an answer for it. Here's what it is. Secondly, um, the revelation of Jesus Christ. So here's what they're saying for the timing. Again, verse 7. Uh, and to you who are troubled, you who get trouble, uh, rest will come to you. That's going to happen when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. And a number of commentators point out that the day of the Lord and other end time happenings are a series of events. There's other things that happen. Uh, they are not, you know, if, if you look at during the tribulation, they are, there, there is hell on earth. I mean, it, there is massive judgment from God on earth. And, and there are things from the skies. And, you know, I mentioned Revelation 6 a number of different times. They literally go into the mountains, into the rocks, into the caves, and they want the mountains to fall on them because God is angry and they know it is God. So there's no question whatsoever that it is from God. Okay? Um, they, some of that is happening. That happens for seven years especially the last three and a half years, that happens before everlasting destruction comes. So there are, 
number, the, the coming of the Christ is not just at the end. There's other events. And so that's what uh, scholars are saying. It's a whole uh, revelation of Christ is a, a whole complex of events, uh, beginning with the pre-tribulation rapture uh, and ending with Christ's second coming in Revelation chapter 19. And again, uh, there are going to be skeptics that are going to say, okay, so you're, you don't like what it seems to say, so you're adding other stuff to it, um, you know, you're, this, this rationale. Uh, and yet, I've, I've said it before, and we're, we're going to look at it again in just a minute. If the rapture happened at the end of the tribulation, we would go to heaven and turn around and come right back. Okay? That really doesn't make any sense. But to have a post-tribulation rapture, because Revelation chapter 19, keep a finger here, or it's easy enough to find, but Revelation chapter 19, now I mentioned this before when we were talking about the church being uh, in heaven, the, the four and 20 elders representing the church, but we know the church is on earth in Revelation 2 and 3. Jesus writes these letters to the church. The church is on earth. They're literal Ephesus, Smyrna, Smyrna, Thyatira, Philadelphia. They're literal places with literal people. In Genesis, or I'm sorry, Revelation 19, uh, verse number 6. And I heard, as it were, a voice of a great multitude, and as a voice of many waters, and as a voice of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor unto him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he saith unto me, Write, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. So the marriage supper of the Lamb, which is for the church, the church is called the Bride of Christ, that's right here in Revelation 19. So the church is in heaven to be having this supper. Mm -hmm. It's in heaven. Again, they're fine linen, they're clean and white. Uh, verse number 11, I saw heaven open. Behold, a white horse, he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and his head many crowns. Uh, 13, he's closed with, uh, he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. His name is called the Word of God. Okay, uh, John in the beginning, you know, John wrote Revelation, right? John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. The Word of God is Jesus Christ. There's no question of that. Verse 14, and the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Again, the same language used in verse number 8. So the church... The marriage supper of the Lamb, the church with Christ in heaven, comes to earth in verse 14. Verse 15, out of his mouth goes a sword that he should smite the nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. So the church is coming with Christ to earth. Uh, and this is what we refer to as the second coming. He comes and breaks up the battle of Armageddon. So, the armies, so, so as we think of this, the Christ is coming on a horse, armies, us, are coming with him. There are people on earth that face Verse 15, he smites the nations, he rules them with the rod of iron, he treads them with the winepress of the wrath of God. So, who is going to be more awestruck over Christ's coming to earth with his armies? The people 
on the receiving end or the armies that are already with Christ? Who, who's going to be more amazed at what happens when Christ returns? Huh? The people on earth, right? I mean, the church is with Christ. They, they've already perfected. been with him. They're already perfected. They, okay, so keep that in mind. They will be the, the, the recipients of the wrath are going to be, wow, you know. Okay. Thurs, or 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 again, where you were. Maybe you kept your finger there. Um, 2 Thessalonians 1. Verse 10 is a very interesting verse. And here's, here's a, a third argument, uh, okay? The, the parenthetical I talked about, uh, Christ's second coming is not necessarily just one event. And then uh, this is, again, another challenging thing to explain, but hopefully keep that background, uh, what I just went through in mind. So, verse number 10. We, we know it's talking, for, um, for verse 9, we should be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord, from the glory of his power. So we know verse 9 is talking about Christ, okay? When, notice, he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe because our testimony among you was believed in that day. So here's where I'm going with this. We, we have the little word, and it, I, I've mentioned this. You have to be careful not to take a preposition like in or by or with. Uh, you have to be careful not to build a doctrine on one of those, okay? Because it's very difficult to translate uh, the Greek word en, E-N, it's difficult to translate that sometimes. So it can mean in, it can be about, it, it can be different. So um, you, you can't, you have to look at other verses, compare scripture with scripture. So, um, but again, I'm answering the question, okay, how do I look at this as a pre-tribulationist? What does, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints mean? There's different ways of looking at this verse. Um, does it mean that the saints that are on earth are going to glorify, praise, honor, be amazed at God because their bodies are changed at that point? Or are those, and, and hopefully I'm not losing you on this, when he shall come to be glorified because of his saints, okay? When, think of those on earth that were persecuting Christians. Christ returns and oh, there's those Christians that we were persecuting coming with him. So they were amazed and awed and spellbound over Christ's being glorified as well as those that were glorified with him. You see what I'm saying? I don't know that I explained that well, but you can, uh, verse number 10 uh are the saints are the ones are the saints the ones that are amazed in honoring God or are the people on earth amazed because God Christ comes and his saints are with him and so they are they are amazed because of the saints already being glorified did you, did I you follow that what I'm what I'm saying yeah no okay um Louise kind of kind of Okay, um, let me see if I... A lot, a lot to digest. Yeah. Uh, could it possibly mean that because of his saints being with him, and we know from Revelation 19 that's what happens, because of his saints coming with him, that they were also amazed at, wow, not just 
not just we're amazed because we're glorified when Christ returns. No, we're, that's going to happen earlier. Uh, other people are amazed at us being with Christ when Christ returns. And so we, uh, here's how one man puts it. Thomas writes, in a unique sense, Christ is the glory and object of the wonder, but he shares that with us. He allows us to be recipients of that same amazement because we're, we're with him uh, when he returns. So, um, Again, that's uh, not, uh, it's verses that post-tribulation love. Um, there is an answer. Some people would say, wow, you're really pushing it. Uh, but I will say this, there are verses that point to pre-tribulation, like First Thessalonians 4, uh, that a post-trib has a very hard time. <laughs> trying, trying to answer. Uh, again, you know, some people argue, well, pastor, if you're a pastor, and what if you're wrong, and all your people are going to go through the tribulation, um, you know, are, aren't you doing them a disservice by not preparing them? And I've, I've said before, I'm doing a disservice to not prepare you for persecution, because I believe persecution uh, can come. I believe um, persecution, you know, we've been sheltered as a country. We have not had persecution like other places have had. Uh, you know, I, I want to remind you that, um, I haven't brought this up lately, but there, there, are, there are pastors being fined right now because they hold church in our country. They are being fined right now. Uh, and lawsuits are going on. There's a number of lawsuits in uh, there's California, Illinois, Maine, um, I think Kentucky there might be one. So, so there, and, and it is blatant that they are targeting churches. A casino can do the same thing, but they can, they're, they're allowed, but the church is not. So there, there is targeting, there is, there is definitely religious discrimination going on in our country right now. So um, I certainly do not want to give you the impression that, um, you know, and sometimes we think, oh, we're, we're, we're America, the buck stops here, you know, uh, Christianity, all the world focus. No, it doesn't. You know what, if God is not, um, Letting us down if he decides we go through persecution. God does not fail. It's not like, oh man, we missed the right. No, there's no guarantee in the Bible that says America is going to stay true to the end. And then once we fall away, the rapture, there, there's nothing like that in the Bible. We could face persecution. Where I have a problem is, um, and let's end with this. Turn to Jude which is one chapter only, and it is right before Revelation, Jude 1. Verse 14. And again, I'm not, I think Dave mentioned not too long ago the book of Enoch. Um, and Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with 10,000 of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to, and to convince, you will see the word ungodly more in this verse than is any other verse of the Bible, to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Um, God, Christ comes, and, and when we get into the details of the tribulation, um, it is punishment for a Christ-rejecting world. 
Okay, that's what it's for. You can't, you can't escape the purpose of the tribulation. Now, part of it, I, I guess I should clarify, uh, a lot of it's focused on Israel and Jerusalem because it's, it's Daniel's 70th week. It's, it's, got, it's the last week of God's people. Uh, so there is, uh, the focal point is going to be Israel and Jerusalem uh, during the tribulation. But it, it is a time that turns the Jews back to God. But it is also a time where God is pouring out wrath on Christ rejectors, okay? And I'm pretty simple. If we have been forgiven by Christ, why are we gonna lump, be lumped in with those who have not been forgiven by Christ and are getting punished? It doesn't, it doesn't pass the, the justice of God sense to me. It just doesn't make any sense that we're going to, our sins are gone. They're taken care of. They're as far as the east is from the west. They've been thrown behind God's back. Why would we be punished with them? And of course, the ultimate punishment we know is, is hell. Um, but I, to me, I, I have a real problem with suggesting that God is going to treat us the same as those reject him. Because throughout the Bible, once you become a child of God, you are loved differently. Amen. You are treated differently. You have a different father. You have a different future. Yeah. You have a different, all those things. So uh, that's how I can say that I'm, I don't think I'm doing you an injustice by not preparing you for the, tri the tribulation. Um, <clears throat> any, any questions? Uh, we're going to start in chapter uh, 2 next week. Uh, chapter 2 of 2 Thessalonians. So chapter 2 is really interesting. It gets into the man of lawlessness. It gets into believing the lie. It gets into right out of the gate, except there come a falling away first, which is apostasy. And what does that mean? So there's a lot of uh, things to wrestle with and digest in, uh, in chapter 2. But no questions? All Just right. a comment about the, the minister's the gentleman in California is John MacArthur. MacArthur? Yep. Yeah, MacArthur. Because he's got a big lawsuit. And things well, going he, on there's there. other ones that actually oh, yeah. that Liberty Council was was um, representing somebody well before MacArthur made his. Yeah, I think that's his, his stand. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a more recent one. But yeah. mm -hmm. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for um, you uh, giving us what we need to know uh, about the end times. Uh, Lord, we know that uh, there's good people that uh, differ with us on uh, the timing of uh, the rapture and some of the details uh, at your coming, and yet uh, we certainly know from your word your character, and uh, we certainly uh, see the difference that you make uh, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament that how, how you uh, treat differently your people. And so, uh, Lord, I, I pray that uh, the realization and the thought and the belief that we will not go through the tribulation, uh, that that doesn't make us uh, lazy, that that doesn't make us uh, unwatchful, that that doesn't make us uh, less careful, uh, but that, Lord, we would... Uh, be burdened more for those that do not know you. We'd be burdened more for those that obey not the gospel. Uh, that we'd be burdened more uh, of those for those that are going to face uh, everlasting punishment and everlasting destruction from you. And so, Lord, we uh, we don't want to use the rapture as an excuse to uh, for loose living or lack of watchfulness, uh, we know you could come at any time. We know the trumpet could sound uh, right now, could sound on our way home, uh, could sound at any time. And you want us to uh, watch and occupy and be warning. And so help us to be uh, faithful in that. And again, we just uh, thank you uh, for your love. We thank you for your forgiveness through Christ. And we pray in his name. Amen. Amen.
Thanks for watching. Have a good night.